All right then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask that you turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the very first verse. The Bible says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether it's out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter, of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, the abundant, uh, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might be that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this good building that we can come in out of the wet tonight and look into your word once again, this side of eternity. Lord, we praise you for your word and how it should frame our lives and the things that we know and the things that we learn. We thank you for it. Lord, we pray for everyone that is here tonight, Lord, that you would touch them. For those in need of salvation, Lord, that you might save them, that you would open their hearts and cause them uh, to cry out to you. And for the saved, that we might be encouraged in your word, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we uh, will be preaching tonight on the power of Christ, and I am not by any chance usually a serial preacher, meaning that I preach in a series of things, but I, I probably will go against my usual and look at the power of each entity of God. Now, when we think, we can think about the whole glory of God and the triune God. I don't like to say Trinity because it gives too much credence to the Catholic Church, but we do have a triune God, and every person in that triune does uh, different things, and all of it magnifies the whole. And uh, what I have never really thought about is the power that each one contains and the power that the whole contains. And sometimes we get so narrow-minded, but have you ever thought that even the place which we live, the atmosphere that we abide in, if it wasn't for the glory of God, we would not be here. That's it. There would not even be air to breathe if we were here and God did not move. See, that's, uh, that's the strength and the person and the fullness of the Godhead is that everything and anything, all things are dependent on Him. Yeah. And when you begin to look at things like that, the sovereignty of God and even our dependence on Him in redemption and salvation is not a hard thing to understand when you realize that he, everything is Him and He is everything. And that that, that seems redundant, but it's also true that uh, there is great power in the person of Christ. Uh, the work that Christ did, none other in the Godhead could accomplish but the very living Son of God. Uh, the triune God has always been but us. 
uh, made man in our own image, even then was he whom he is now, the person of God. He, uh, as Daniel looked into, uh, I mean, as uh, the king looked into the fire at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he said, I see a fourth man, as even unto the Son of God, then Christ was, and still is, and will be forever. That, that is an amazing thing to me, the very living power of God. And, and listen, if anything false doctrine is done, is to mute the power of God. I had a woman, and I'm not going to say her name, but y'all, everyone in this building, except maybe for Jarrett, would know her. She told me that Christ did the best that he could, and the rest was up to us. You know, that, that, that is blasphemy. That, that is true blasphemy. In every sense of the word. Now, uh, I feel she did it in ignorance yeah. because you know what? She's been taught that her whole life. Yeah. True. Uh, and, and so, if the fullness of the Godhead's been revealed to you, it's like the best present, the best knowledge that anybody can give you how powerful and wonderful and how dependent we are on God in everything that we do. And so, in the first verse, Paul writing, uh, the second letter to Corinth and said that he ought to feel bad about he, what he wrote, but he didn't because it was needful for them. And in, ver in chapter 12, the first verse, he begins, it's not expedient or necessary or needful for me to doubtless to glory. Now, when a man begins to glory in himself, uh, in a, a preaching man begins to glory in within himself, you look out, he's going to fall. Every man that I've ever seen that did that, and I can name two off the top of my head, and they fell. Both of them flat on their face. So Paul's, uh, Paul's caution was this. He didn't want to mess up his own ministry by glorying in himself. Yeah. And you know what? Every one of us should be the very same way never so proud, never so perfect, uh, everything just so right that you begin to glory in yourself. And I've seen a lot of a lot of men, and honestly a lot of women too, make the very mistake and end up in a huge mess as time goes by. So he says, I will not glory. It's not necessary. It's not good. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, remember that Paul was apostolic. He was an apostle, an apostle born out of time. And so his revelations and his visions were very noteworthy. Uh, that's the bulk of the, of the church letters that we have today. And that's why they are canonized. That's why they are recognized as the true word of God is because he was apostolic. You know, that's not a bad word. It just you got to know how to apply it. And if you know how to apply it, you know it's an impossibility today for someone to be an apostle. But it wasn't for Paul because he met the Lord bodily on the road to Damascus and that qualified him. That made him, that he was, uh, he met all the credentials that an apostle has. And he says, uh, he said, I'll come to that in a little bit. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now, I'll, I'll notice a couple of things, because again, you know, uh, uh, people get excited out of this out-of-body experience, and, and I've heard people use that and, and just be so foolish in it. And... First of all, I want you to see, he was simply saying, I don't know if I really met this man, but I may have. He said, I may have met him in the body. And it may have been a spiritual thing. Now, this is my own take on it, and you can take it home and study it. I believe that he's talking about the Apostle John. And I believe that he understood and knew what John saw when he went up. And I don't think it was him, because we'll see at the end of this thing, he says, of such a man, one that's been called up, that one on glory. And if it had been himself, he would be right back to glory in himself. So that's an impossibility. So I believe he was speaking of the Apostle John. That's my own take on it. 
uh, you you can take it for whatever it's worth, but I believe and I, I'm certain he knew John because John was a, a member of the church at Jerusalem and he was up there at least twice. Mm -hmm. And so they, they knew each other uh, in, in, that, in, in that context. Verse 3, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now, with that said, he had to have had experiences outside his body to make this statement in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we don't know how these visions went, but we know most of our teaching about the catching away from Paul. He writes of it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 or 5, 4, I think, 2 Thessalonians 4. And he wrote to the Corinth, the church at Corinth, and uh, chapter 15, the very same thing. And so you don't see the catching away in this body. Uh, that's an impossibility. Mm -hmm. So he had these experiences, but the reason he had these experiences was because he was an apostle. He, he was not a regular, routine Christian. He was apostolic. So when, when you look at this in the context of the writing, that's why he saw those things, and that's why they were noteworthy. Uh, verse 4, how that he, meaning this man, man, he wasn't sure if he knew bodily or if he knew them uh, in the spirit realm, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, if you'll follow the introduction uh, after the church letters at the beginning of the Revelation, and you get it over to chapter 4, uh, it said that John fell down as a dead man. He, he was amazed. He, he didn't think he ought to look on these things, so that's the very identifier that he was talking of John. He was talking of John the Apostle. And so he saw these things happen. And he says, so John, this man, whomever he was, whatever he was, that one I will glory because he's seen paradise. That's, that's who to glory. So the next time that we think we're beginning to make advances and things are going good, you remember that Paul said that was something very, very cautious something we did not need to do, something that was not uh, favorable for Christian people. And, and, and so he makes it very plain uh, that pride can be a real problem to successful Christians. And when I say that, people that are used of the Lord. Verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Now you think about yourself, and you are the only one that can answer this, because I, I, I don't know, and uh, we're all just about family here, um, and only you know your own heart. Have you ever thought how amazing that is? Your thoughts, your motivations, how you present to others is really controlled by you. Why you say this or that, though it may seem charitable, or loving, where does it come from? I can't, all I know is that you're saying it. But only you know why and when you said that. Why you said that. And he says, so the one thing I'm going to glory in or be proud of or shed light upon, that's really what glory means. The only thing I'm going to shed light on is my infirmities, my problems, my health issues. And so he says, though I would desire to glory. Now, Paul was cut from the same stuff I am, and you are, and every one of us under the sound of my voice, there's a desire there for pride. A desire to glory. And you know what I have found? If the Lord just uses you that much, you want more, you want more of the glory. Uh, and uh, what I try to do, you know, oh, brother, actually, that was a great sermon. Give the Lord the praise for it. And if I can keep from it and not seem rude, I don't even look at them in the eye. Because there is, therein is, is, is the self-glory, the self-pride. 
And, and so Paul gives us a very uh, real uh, good piece of, piece of advice and a real, real good insight even to the redeemed uh, is that desire of self-glory. It's present. It's there. For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool. Now if we do it, that's how we present. If we take pride in it and love it and like what we're saying, like what we're singing, like what we're doing, what the Bible says is you're a fool. And because, uh, you know, the, the foolish part is this. You don't know what kind of danger you're in. You don't know your position. You don't know where you're at. That's a very dangerous position to be in. Then he says, for I will say the truth but now I forbear. So he, what he was saying, I have something else to say, and I could, I could be extensive on the fact of how foolish you're being, but right now I'm not hold the line. Uh, the rest of that verse says, lest any man should think of me above which he, seem, which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth me, that he heareth of me. In other words, what you see and what you hear is what you get. You know, that, that takes a, a, a level of honesty that many of us do not have. What you see is what you get. What you hear, you know, it's a whole lot better just to be honest with someone than run your ideas on Facebook, isn't it? Uh, we need to be cautious of that. You know, that's an instrument that can be used for good. I don't think there was one uh, one living vessel. Uh, I think living vessels, mankind's soul, they're, you could say they're good or bad because the Bible says they're either predestinated or they're not. But this pew is neither good nor bad, is it? It's impossibility for it to be. It ain't even living. Some people say, well, it's a good pew because it's down at the house of God, but that's how it's being used. But what if it went to a bar somewhere? Would it become an evil pew? No, it, it, it's how mankind uses it. So the next time we get on the internet, remember it's how we use it, not what it is that makes the difference. And, and, and so we see then that Paul uh, said, don't glory in yourself. Don't think you're, you're that great because you're not. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, and that often makes me think, did we get them all or not? Maybe there were things that he saw and that he enjoyed that he didn't write down because he didn't want to look too good, that he did not want to look too knowledgeable, that he did not want to get too much praise for. He said, I, had an ab I have abundance of revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, there's really kind of three pieces of this. I want you to say, see, first of all, he called it a thorn in the flesh. Now, I don't know about y'all, but down at Carlisle, there were lots of thorn trees and bushes and stuff like that. And one time, I was walking up a creek bank, and Judy shoved me, and I caught myself like this. But the problem is, I caught myself on a thorn like that. And, man, it, it, it really, really hurt. And I knew Mama could get it out when I got home, but I was trying to walk. And even though I wasn't putting weight on it, every time I did this, this foot would move too, and the pain got worse. And uh, I hobbled home, and she pulled it out. And uh, it really hurt for the second she pulled, but when it was out, it was out. And so every time I moved, the pain got worse. And when you have a thorn in the flesh, either it's a literal thorn or a problem in your flesh, an illness, a disability, whatever it may be, the more you move, the more it hurts. And that's sometimes 
uh, where we're at. And then I want you to see the next thing it says, a messenger of Satan. Now, it, with our story of Job and the truth revealed in that book, how did Satan do this? How did he accomplish this against Paul first? He had to go to God Amen. and he had to approach him. And maybe, maybe the Lord God said, have you considered my servant Paul? And so you know the rest of the story. So the next time you find an individual, uh, uh, a person with an infirmity of the flesh, uh, serving the Lord, don't feel sorry for them. Pray for them, certainly that they won't hurt. But see, there's a reason behind that. God works by purpose and design and reason. And there is a reason that individual has that issue. Is it authored by Satan? Could be. Is it authored by God? At, at the very least, God allowed it. And it could be authored by him. It could be that he put that on him. The only reason we know this was an act of Satan is because Paul said that it was, and Paul had an understanding that it came from it, it, it came from Satan and not from the Lord God, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, to be buffeted is to be slowed down, not stopped. Uh, if you let something stop you, it's not in the will of God. If you let whatever the illness is, whatever the malady is, what, if, if it's just the fact you don't have a vehicle to, uh, to drive far places, whatever the issue is, if you let that happen, don't blame it on God. Now, you may be buffeted, you may be slowed down, but keep trying. It, 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 may be, it may be a hindrance to you out there. There may be a difficulty given you, but just keep trying. Uh, keep moving. You may have to walk slower than you did 20 years ago, but keep walking. Uh, keep, keep that forward momentum. And so we find uh, that it wasn't to stop Paul, but rather to slow him down. How long did he spend at Corinth? Two years. That's, that's, do you think that it was just simply... Uh, happenstance that way? No, I, I believe he was buffeted in the flesh. He probably desired to go further, but he couldn't. So he taught those Corinthian believers everything they needed to know. See, God works by purpose and design, not by accident. And, and so we find that uh, that this malady, and many people think this is his vision, because one time, and I think it's the letter to the church in Ephesus, he says uh, 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 that someone was writing for him, and in another place, I think the letter Timothy, he says, you see how big a letter I write, so that he could see what was being done. Uh, seems reasonable to me, I, I don't know exactly, but it certainly seems reasonable, but whatever the malady, he accepted it. You, you know when you begin real happiness, when you begin to accept the situation for what it is. I want to do this, and I want to do that. I want to be a nurse practitioner. Uh, I, I want to go across the sea. On and on we could go, but bloom where you're planted. And if God wants to uproot you, I guarantee you he will. And he's got the stuff to do it with. If not, bloom where you're planted. And, and, and we find that as the Lord's people, sometimes we don't, uh, we're not happy in that. We don't have contentness like we should. Verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Now, that seems pretty effective praying, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a real honest about this. Because we're, by nature, and myself dumped in there included, by nature, we are not an accepting people. Uh, I besought the Lord, I can't even tell you how many times, to take my epilepsy from me. And I think I accept it, have another seizure, and I want it gone again. 
that's not really accepting it, is it? It's not. And we go, well, Brother Larry, that's just your flesh, yeah. But Paul tried to control it, did he not? So even the fact that he just besought the Lord three times was impressive to me. I believe I would have uh, sought him a hundred times. But three times going before the Lord and the Lord saying no, made him say, hey, this is how it's going to be and I'll bloom where I'm planted. That, that, that's a remarkable man. That's a man that loves God more than he loves himself. And one that no doubt and, and certainly was very useful for the cause of Christ. Verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, that, that end statement it, it is another one of those self-reviews. Does the power of Christ rest on you? Because from what I take from this text, it doesn't, everybody, just because you're saved. He, he, he gives something up that was dear, his vision, that the power of Christ might rest on him. You know, that's loving the power of Christ more than you love yourself. I, I'm not sure that I can uh, get my mind around that, that so much he loved God that he said, okay, I'm blind, it just will have to work. That, that's a, do, you, do you want the power of Christ that much? That, 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 that's a self-examine, isn't it? Do you want the power of Christ in your life so much that you will accept things exactly like they are? That's unbelievable, is it not? Uh, it's fine as long as you're feeling good. It, it, it's fine when you're young, right? It, it's fine uh, when you don't need but a couple hours of sleep and you're wound up and ready to go again. But what about when you get old? Saying, this is sufficient for me. This is, this is good. You know, I thought back to the, down through the years, there's at least two churches that called me, one probably about 12 years ago, and I really had to seek the face of the Lord, a church I dearly loved then in Ohio. And so I went before the Lord, and he says, no, you're exactly where, you want to, where, you, where I want you to be. And that's what, that's what has to happen. Bloom where you're planted. So only you know if you have the power of Christ in your life. Now, Pentecostal people have, has about convinced us having power of Christ in our lives is flopping around on the ground and foaming at the mouth and screaming. Is that the power of Christ? I think not. What was the biggest ministry of Christ? Was it not a sacrifice? Mm -hmm. So to me, to have the power of Christ in your life is to be self-sacrificing. Lord, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. If you want me to stay, I'll stay. That's a very difficult thing, is it not? If you want me to move, I'll move. If you want me to stay put, I'll stay put. That, 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 is, that is a very difficult place to come to, but yet and still we find that that's exactly where Paul was at. If he wanted the power of Christ in his life, he had to put Christ first. Uh, verse 10, therefore I will take pleasure in my infirmities. really goes back to exactly what he says in verse 5. Therefore I will take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now notice what he says. I will take pleasure in my infirmities. Man, that's a very difficult thing to do. You know, if I understand this what I, like I think I do, he was saying, I'm sure glad I'm blind. That's amazing, is it not? And you know why he was glad he was blind? Because that was God's plan for his life. Not pleasant, not fun, but his plan. And that's exactly what he meant. And, and I'll be honest, and I'm not got there yet, 
But can I really say, I'm sure glad I have epilepsy. Man, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Be very hard, would it not? Be very difficult, but that's what that's what Paul was saying. I'm going to glory in it. If God's not going to take, take it from me, I'm going to be happy in it and take pleasure. Literally says, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches. That's when people hate him and cut him off in necessities. You know what? Uh, listen, it's th them ships out in the harbor, it keeps going like it's going. You're going to learn about necessities very, very soon. And listen, a necessity isn't fried chicken. A necessity isn't steaks. A necessity isn't even bacon. Necessities is something for you and your family to eat. And when I say something, I just mean something. And he says, I glory in that. I, I, I've not had a lot to eat. You know, the way that I understand, if I understand correctly, when he was in prison before his execution, if the people had not ministered to him and Timothy had not come, he probably would have starved to death. And he says, I'm going to glory in that. that. That's where Christ put me. That's where I'm at. And I'm going to glory in it because that's exactly how we made perfect in weakness. You know, have you ever been so hungry you got weak? I have, especially I was a little bigger and my sugar was a little bit wacky. When my sugar got low, I, I didn't even sometimes know what was going on. One of the few times in my life I really screamed at Donna was right down here under the hill and we was mowing Adam's yard and my sugar was just bottomed out. And I will remember saying, Donna, just get in the car. And I, I screamed it. And then I thought, I need something to drink. And I went down and got Diet Dr. Pepper, and that just forced a habit. No sugar in it at all. No, no, no value in it. And that's, you know, how could we glory in that? How could we make that all right? It's an infirmity, is it not? Why are you upset about it? Why are you mad about it? More, you know, uh, use it to, uh, to God's grace. Use it to God's glory when, when we see things like that. In distresses for Christ's sake. Now, distresses are kind of unusual Best way I can describe describe distresses is probably death. Uh, last morning, morning mom died. I was on my way down to Erin before I even got to the end of Bumps Mill Road. Uh, Donna called me and said she's gone. And uh, that's distresses, isn't it? A month later, Ashley's little baby died. That's distresses, isn't it? That, that's hard. A month ago, Aunt, pa Aunt Nancy died. That's distresses. This week, Ashley's husband died. Week before last, dear brother Mark Titus went home to be with the Lord. That's distresses, isn't it? And certainly when they're saved, and we can say, but you know what? Irregardless, there's an empty void there. Believe me, I know are you going to glory in that? How are you going to glory in that? Well, he brought me through it. He brought me to the other side. Let me tell you. You know, maybe I help somebody one day. Let me tell you when, about when my mother died. See, distress has come for a reason. And, and often we skip over them and we boo-hoo on ourselves, and, and on and on we could go. But in reality, Paul rejoiced in them. And notice what he says, for Christ's sake. So a last piece of this, I think, is not to take pride in what you do. Back to the pride issue. You know, uh, man, Larry really did good when his mother died, didn't he? You could lap that up like a dog, couldn't you? No, you don't do it. You do it for Christ's sake. When someone comes by and says, Larry, how did you get through that? 
I did it. The Lord brought me to it. The Lord did it. That's what we're to do. Have you ever thought about people and whether the departed one is lost or saved? Have you ever wondered when people don't know the Lord how they get through something like that? I, I really have because when mom died, when Judy died, the only thing I knew to do is take it before the Lord. Uh, I, and I, I can't understand people. I, I feel sorry for people that don't have that outlet, don't you? I, I really do. And, and, and so we should, as the Lord's people, more than anything else, desire to have the power of Christ in my life. He was really, he was ready to give up any of those things that he listed there. He embraced difficulties just to have the power of Christ in his life. Do you do that? And, and more than important, because you know, if you have the power of Christ in your life, I'll guarantee you this, you could always have more. But it, it doesn't come easy. Uh, it doesn't come without sacrifice. Uh, you know what? I'll say this, and then we'll close for tonight. People don't want that for you. Um, difficulties on the workplace and things like that, I'm almost done with them. They didn't want that for me, did they? Sometimes you have to just be uprooted, don't you?